Barbara Wilson, and I'd like to welcome you to the Michigan Medicine Peninsula Community Lecture Series. On behalf of the University of Michigan, I'd like to thank Vicki Shirley and the library staff for their partnership, and Bill and Gretchen Soutier for the inspiration and sponsorship of this wonderful event. Thank you so much for joining us today. One of the great strengths of Michigan Medicine is the ability to do translational research from bench to bedside, directly informing the research and improving patient outcomes. Dr. Sammy Malik is a physician scientist and professor of hematology and oncology at the University of Michigan. He is also the co-leader of the cancer genetics program at the Robo Cancer Center. He is an internationally recognized opinion leader in hematological malignancies. Dr. Malik's groundbreaking research has contributed to major advances in the understanding and treatment of blood cancers. Uh, please feel welcome to ask questions during the presentation, as well as there'll be a period afterwards uh, for questions and answers. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sammy Malik. speaking and, and that's why there likely are gaps that you can fill if you have personal or other questions with your with your questions is I want to talk to you first of all what blood is. I want to talk to you about what cancer is, at least touching the surface of that. And what what kind of blood how blood cancers originate and what kind of blood cancers there are. I'll talk a little bit about general treatment patterns and paradigms and then talk about why, why therapies don't always work talk a little bit about the dynamics of relapse after you receive therapy, and then switch maybe to advances in novel targeted therapy and immunological therapies, and then discuss maybe what excites us today and how we uh, increase the fraction of patients with blood cancers that are cured, talk about new targets, disease monitoring that goes beyond physical exams and CT scans, combination therapies, and then how we convert most blood cancers, hopefully, into chronic illnesses. So first of all, blood cancer is a somewhat ill-described term. Um, and we have to define first what blood is and why blood cancer is maybe uh, a good term for some cancers that we are talking about and not such a great term for others. So most of you are thinking about blood as the red juice that flows in your vein and arteries. And of course that's true, and it comprises red cells and a variety of white cells that you don't see when you spill blood because the red cells dominate the picture. But blood cancers don't originate directly in the bloodstream, if you wish. Um, the blood itself doesn't originate in the bloodstream. The blood itself, um, which comprises cell mixtures that are very important to all of us, the blood is made, if you wish, in the bone marrow. And the bone marrow is in your pelvic bones and long thigh bones and long arm bones. And you all have seen bone marrow from animal bones, I trust. You mostly see the fat, but there are actually myriads of cells in there. And these cells um, feel very happy in the bone marrow, and they're made in the bone marrow. And they're made in the bone marrow from a few, maybe 100,000 or so, master cells called stem cells. These stem cells that you couldn't visually identify, they hang out in the bone marrow and when, when asked to produce blood, start dividing. And then there's this major amplification. 
and one little stem cell becomes a gazillion billion blood cells. And that's called hematopoietic differentiation, differentiation. The bone marrow is the source of all the cells that we want to talk about when we talk about blood cells. Um, so the stem cells in the bone marrow, they live for a very long time. Some may live as long as you. And they are chronically exposed to insults, pesticides, radiation, chemotherapy, stuff we don't even know about, we eat in the food. So they're chronically exposed to stuff. And they also occasionally have to divide. And any time the cell needs to divide, make more cells, produce stuff, there, is, there, is, there, there are errors made. And these errors lead to infidelity in replicating the cells. Um, there are errors made in the cells that are the seed of the cancer. Many who have any kind of cancer have had precancerous cells in their body decades before they are ever died. These precancerous cells acquire additional properties that ultimately are recognized as the enemy cancer, but the seeds for that outgrowth of cancer are laid many decades before you are diagnosed. So, blood cancers is also an imprecise term because, as I said, not only is the blood not the source of the cancer, but really the, the apparent stem cells and cells that derive from the cells originating in the blood in the bone marrow. But when you talk about blood cancers involving lymph nodes or spleen or bone, as opposed to, for instance, a multiple myeloma, these cells also originate in the bone marrow and then start traveling and find their homes. Lymphocytes like to sit in lymph nodes, spleen, um, myeloid cells like to be flowed in the blood, red cells flow in the blood, but you just need to cut yourself to know that these blood-borne uh, cells really uh, are all organs. So these secondary lymphoid organs, as we call them, lymph node and spleen, are often enlarged in blood cancers. But you wouldn't call a lymph node blood necessarily, nor would you call the spleen blood, uh, nor would you call a blood cancer moving to the liver or the bones or the lung blood. So that's roughly the origin of where blood cancers come from. Let's talk a little bit about cancer. So. Each of us have a certain view of what cancer is. We, we, you mostly are looking at it as a clinical problem and something that may be threatening to somebody you know or maybe to yourself. We uh, uh, biologists look at cancer uh, from uh, a different perspective. We look at it as trying to sort of understand the enemy and dissecting it into multiple components, so-called hallmarks, so we really so we really know what we're talking about when we're talking about cancer. So if I look outside, I think I'm seeing a, a parking lot full of cars. And I think that because they all sort of look like the gestalt I think a car should look like. But if I saw a cow, I wouldn't call it a car and vice versa. Cancer hallmarks um, are features of cancer cells that make cancer tick and that we need to identify to cause something cancer. Not every lump of cell is a cancer. So what do cancer cells do that's bad? First of all, they don't respect not to grow. For the most part, they grow and divide. One becomes two, four, eight, 16 gazillion. That's not good. You have limited space in your body, so patients do, to accommodate these cells. Cancer cells invade. They don't respect boundaries. They go into organs, sadly, and take up space that's needed. Cancer, way, cancer instructs um, the body to form blood vessels where you shouldn't have any blood vessels, and these blood vessels are there to feed the cancer cells. Cancer cells um, evade the immune system by cloaking themselves. We all have an immune system. We're using it for surveillance. And cancer cells basically downregulate the stuff on their surface that makes them visible. They cloak themselves. Cancer cells change the way they eat and use metabolites. You know, you eat your food and whatnot, but the cancer cells have preferential pathways. 
how they convert the food you eat into something they can use to invade, grow, clothe, and whatnot. So what I'm describing to you are so-called cancer hallmarks, features that most cancers, traits that most cancers have to adopt to survive, grow, and compete. Because they're competing with all your normal cells, not you in person, but with the human beings' normal cells. They compete with them, and they need to succeed in the competition, otherwise they die out. So, when we talk about blood cancers, we're talking about a family of illnesses. Not a happy family, but a family of illnesses that comprises major subtypes. Um, it would just interest me uh, who in the room knows somebody with blood cancer. Well, that is shocking. Not entirely unexpected, it's a bit of a selected pool. But, um, <laughs> but um, I figured that the number would be high. So, um, unlike lung cancer, which is a cancer originating in the lung, I mean, breast cancer, cancer originating in the breast, I gave you the origin of blood cancers, but then it sort of starts splitting up. And so, and so, what are the major blood cancers that we put under the umbrella term blood cancer? Well, there are the leukemias, and leukemia means white blood. It's a term coined by Virchow, a German pathologist, a hundred some years ago. And the leukemias are uncontrolled growth of either of white cells, of particular lineages, if you wish. Um, there are the so-called myeloid cells and the lymphoid cells. We can give them names, I'm sure it adds too much. But it's uncontrolled growth of white cells. So to what degree is this growth uncontrolled? Well, in some patients we can filter out or freeze out pound or kilogram quantities of white cells when they're not in remission. That's a huge amount. That's like multiple jaws full. Um, you can envision that that's a problem. These cells displace normal cells. Those are the leukemias, white blood. They tend to have high white cell counts, not always, can have a big spleen, not always, but because these leukemia cells disrespect the body, they just like to divide. In a somewhat dumb way, because by the time they're done dividing and the patient dies, they die too. But they don't get that, and so they just divide. And they divide, and they divide, and when they divide, what they do is, they take out the bone marrow space that the patient needs to make blood, because they need the space. So it's a competition for space, basically. By the time they've crowded out the bone marrow space, a patient with leukemia doesn't have enough red blood cells, doesn't have enough good white cells, doesn't have enough platelets, and they suffer from a myriad of consequences like bleeding or infection or other things. Then there are the lymphomas. Lymphomas are cancers that predominantly sit in the lymph nodes and the spleen, so-called secondary lymphoid organs. There are about, there are a couple hundred lymph nodes in our body, shockingly high number, but most of them are really small. Um, once precancerous or cancerous cells seed these lymph nodes, they grow in there, and they make them larger and larger and larger, and maybe you have seen folks with enlarged lymph nodes, they can be as big as a fist or even bigger. And um, lymphomas are called lymphomas because they are basically cancers of the B and T lymphocyte lineage. And these B and T lymphocytes normally sit in the lymph nodes but behave very well. We need them for immunity. But in the setting of lymphoma, these lymph nodes are perfect homes for these cancer cells to do all the stuff that told you cancer cells do. And these lymph nodes are large. And by the time they reach a certain size, in a strategically not so opportune place, they can start blocking stuff. Can block off the liver, can block off the kidney, can block off the lung, and cause problems. Lymphomas also sit in the spleen. Then there are the so-called myeloproliferative illnesses, a big word. Myelon is basically um, a descriptive term for the cells called, um, involved in the myeloid lineage. And myeloproliferative illnesses are also cancers that cause a lot of cells that shouldn't be made. Typical examples would be, would be uh, you know, too many red cells, you know, too many white cells, even though I just told you it's leukemias, but CML would be qualified as a myeloproliferative disease. 
And so you again have this paradigm that you are making cells that just want to divide, grow, survive, don't respect natural um, inhibitory signals and fill up your body if you wish. And um, then there is multiple myeloma, which is a so-called plasma cell disorder. Plasma cells are terminally differentiated B lymphocytes that make antibodies. So what do you need antibodies for? Well, if you get your COVID vaccine, you want your normal B cells to make antibodies to find the COVID virus when it gets into the body. Um, we need antibodies. Without antibodies, we cannot live. But the same cells that make antibodies that are our friends, when they convert themselves to cancer, become what's called multiple myeloma. And these so-called plasma cells then do things they shouldn't. They start eroding bone that causes high calcium, they damage your kidneys, bones can fracture, it's a misery, and that's ultimately called multiple myeloma. And then there's a plethora of other less common cancers that fall under the blood cancer category. So the bottom line is blood cancer is an umbrella term for a number of illnesses involving ultimately cells that at one point or another originated in the bone marrow and then found their home somewhere. Are there any questions up to this point? No questions yet. So with this somewhat cursory introduction into the biology and origin of blood cancers, let's talk a little bit about what we do about patients with blood cancers and why we do what we do. So the most important thing when somebody complains of something new big old lump growing out, not having the energy because we're having a new pneumonia, or maybe obtundation from high calcium, or a failing kidney, is to diagnose the problem. And you know, for that you have specialists that train in hematology and oncology, that work together with pathologists and other experts in trying to clearly define what the enemy is. One of the really uh, important thing is to derive at an accurate diagnosis when you are facing a problem that is likely a blood cancer. If you don't have the right diagnosis, you're likely not going to get the right therapy. And if you don't get the right therapy, you're depriving yourself of a major opportunity um, to potentially be cured or to live longer than you otherwise. Because these cancers tend to fill up the body and cause all kinds of uh, problems when there is too many of these cells, at some point, some form of treatment is advised. So, when we talk about treatment, what, what is our goal? We want to ideally treat the patient's cancer but leave the patient intact, right? We don't want to just sort of poison them with something extraordinary that kills every cancer cell but also damages the host. But unfortunately, to have very precise therapies that can target the cancer only and completely leave every normal cell's cell untouched, those therapies barely exist or barely are being developed now. The traditional forms of therapy in cancer are either chemotherapy, poisoning, radiation, or burning, or surgery cutting. So either we, we cut things out, or we irradiate them, try to burn them away, or if the cancer is already in most of the body, when we can't do these localizing things, we try to poison them. And so traditional chemotherapy that often is infused um, by vein, sometimes it's given by mouth, does not know the difference between a cancer cell and a normal cell. And so what we rely on is a little bit of a greater susceptibility at any given moment in time for the cancer cell to tilt over and die and for the normal cells to sort of just make it repair itself and be available. To the patient. And we call that therapeutic index. We want a wide therapeutic index. We want a lot of killing on tumor and very little killing on normal 
But in reality, our therapeutic index is very small. If you make a dosing error by fivefold, which shouldn't happen, you will create major havoc in your patient. And so our, our ability to kill selectively is very limited. So I told you, you, you want to look at it and get, the, get a very clear name onto the problem. Name the cancer well, and if there's any doubts about it, get opinions from others so that you ultimately get the right treatment. And then you wanna um, follow ideally established and tested treatment pathways to treat your cancer. You don't wanna just experiment. Uh, you wanna make sure maybe that 10,000 other individuals have already received the therapy that is being given to you because there's a high likelihood that a lot has been learned about the therapy along the way. And then your physician uh, wants to ascertain that the therapy is actually working. Because obviously the worst thing you can do is infuse six months of chemotherapy into somebody whose tumor is visibly growing on therapy. So you want to have a response assessment and you want to make sure that the therapy is working really well. For tumors like, for instance, a lymphoma that just sits in one node, we can use radiation therapy which is not something you immediately feel, but which basically burns the cells, induces them to, to kill themselves. For more generalized problems, we rely on um, systemic chemotherapy, and there are many different types of drugs with many different mechanisms of action that over time we have learned to apply to different tumors in a selective way. Drug A may be working better on tumor A, drug B on B, and C on C. And really the whole world is looking into this and we're all learning from one another by reading the literature or reading, you know, going to the latest meeting and trying to constantly update what is new and helpful in the treatment of your individual cancer. So now think about a cancer patient coming in with a whole jar full of cancer cells distributed over the body. And you can feel them maybe if they're lymph nodes or you can measure them when you check the blood or you see indirect signs of the cancer being present through a variety of mechanisms. But then you give successful chemotherapy and the patient goes into remission. And remission means that you and the physician or whoever helps out cannot really see the, see the cancer. You look at the patient, you do an exam, you draw some labs, you can see the cancer. And so, and, so the major, and so the major issue at that point is when you are in remission, the major question is really, are you cured or is there something left behind? And a lot of research these days is going into trying to detect the tumor when it's present in minute quantity. There are many ways to do it, but I think uh, what's increasingly being used, in addition to all kinds of scans and bone marrow biopsy and blood tests, is um, trying to develop very sensitive techniques that measure the one in a thousand or one in 10,000 or one in a hundred thousand tumor cells that is hiding somewhere in the presence of normal cells these minimal residual disease scenarios where there's just a tiny amount of tumor left that we cannot detect with conventional techniques in your standard sort of medical office. These techniques are very important and we, we and others are developing them to try to detect the, the cell that is lurking somewhere that may be the cause of a relapse in the future. Because as you know, um, when the tumor is there in the beginning, there may be as many as 10 to the 12 or so tumor cells, a very big number, a one with 10 with 12 zeros. But after chemotherapy, that may have been debulked to maybe 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 8 cells, a much smaller number, still a big number, but in reality, no more than, a, than in the bottom of a cup, maybe, distributed over the body. But if that remaining 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 8 cells is not eliminated with additional therapies, then the tumor will come back. And that's called relapse, right? And um, relapse is devastating because you know you thought you were doing great, and now your tumor is coming back. So working on techniques to predicting how much tumor is left behind, 
molecularly characterizing that tumor and identifying its vulnerabilities and potentially targeting it with therapies that you didn't use initially, so-called non-cross-resistant therapies, may help you to further reduce the disease burden and possibly ultimately to affect cure. So if our standard therapies are um, not so great at distinguishing bad from good, how do we make that better? And um, about 25 years ago, uh, a gentleman named Brian Drucker um, had an idea to target chronic myeloid leukemia cells, or CML, which at that point caused the patient's death maybe in four to five years after the diagnosis. He had the idea of taking a small pill that he knew would target a particular abnormality in that cancer cell, or BCA able, and to target that with a pill and hope that that would have a good outcome. After having done the kind of stuff we all do, experimenting with these tumors in the laboratory first. And the results, as you know, were remarkable in that Levac and a whole generation of follow-up medications have dramatically changed the outlook of patients with CML, which now often live a life almost as long or as long as individuals who don't have chronic leukemia. And because that pill that was used then, the Gleevec, was targeted to hit a specific aberration in the cancer, like a molecular docking, if you wish, the term targeted therapy was coined. And targeted therapy, trying to get at the vulnerability of each cancer cell, is sort of the holy grail of cancer research now. So how do you go about developing targeted therapies? I mean, you know, you couldn't just sort of go to the shelf, grab a pill box, and say, here, that's targeted for you. So you don't know what the targets are, and you don't know what the pills are, and you don't know how they interact. So, so if you want to develop the next generation of therapies, the basic paradigm is as follows. The first thing you need to do is you need to understand how the cancers tick. You need to understand the internal wirings of the cancer cell, and you need to understand what the vulnerabilities are. If a cancer cell has figured out a way to eat a lot more sugar than the normal cell, well maybe then clamping off the sugar supply may or may not kill that cancer cell. You're looking at trying to convert the advantages that the cancer cells have figured out into the disadvantage. The cell that proliferates 10 times faster than the normal cell may be very susceptible to drugs that kill the cell cycle. But there are much more specific changes cancer cells use to gain advantages that many scientists in the world are characterizing through a variety of molecular techniques that each are opportunities to develop the next target. So as long as a cancer cell has something that's different from normal, and as long as the cancer cell needs that abnormality to live, and as long as you can find a drug or chemical structure that inhibits that, you may have the next target. And so a lot of investigators in the University of Michigan and elsewhere, including myself, we are working on trying to characterize what makes the tumor cells tick, what these specific abnormalities are, and how we can target them. Now, how do you figure out what makes a tumor cell tick? How do you figure out what the vulnerability is that if you look at the cell dies? Well, you know, think you put them under the microscope and take a look, but all you see is little dots, right? So that's not going to work. So, so in reality, figuring out what's, um, what's acquired and, and aberrant and pathologic and wrong in a cancer cell is a very tall order. And you need a variety of techniques, approaches, and thoughts about how you find these things. These things are all submicroscopic. They happen at the molecular level. And so you have to have molecular techniques that can detect changes in cancer cells. And then you have to characterize them, figure out how they work. And, and that's what, you know, 100,000 or more scientists in the world are doing every day. 
they're trying to figure out what the individual vulnerabilities are, what's abnormal, they talk to one another and try to inform each other, try to get at the next therapy. There have been many successful targeted therapies developed through this reasoning uh, since Brian Drucker uh, came up with Gleevec for CMR. Uh, there are targeted therapies for certain lung cancers, there are therapies for breast cancer, and in hematologic malignancies, we have had major advances in multiple myeloma, in lymphoma, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. We now have targeted therapies for some of the acute leukemias. We have therapies for BCOA with positive ALL. So there's been a lot of progress, and it's very remarkable if you are doing this as long as I have for 18 years now, how patients that uh, in the past would have not done well are alive today because of these novel therapies. Um, are there any questions at this point? Don't be shy now. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so that's all try and error, really. So there is an entire machinery in industry, and there's an entire machinery in academia that is trying to go from target identification to a final product that you can get from the pharmacist. And you know, if you start out with, I'm gonna expand a little bit on your question, I think it's important. If you start out with characterizing in leukemia A, the new vulnerability, then you have to start thinking about, well, what molecules do I have to inhibit them, for instance? Well, maybe you have not. Then you have to talk to the chemist first and see whether they can make a few for you. And then you try them out and then make a few better ones. Then you try those out and you make better ones and then they take five years. And um, by the time you feel like you have a couple good candidates, then there's an entire sort of knowledge base of what the molecular structure could potentially do wrong in terms of side effects. And many compounds at that point, and I'm not a drug developer personally, many compounds at that point are already basically not seeing the light of day. They're known to have certain things that will ultimately not help the patient, even though it kills the tumor. But the ones that survive then go into animal studies, uh, mice, rats, dogs, and you know whatever survives in that process then ultimately may be picked up and enter what's called a phase one trial. And in a phase one clinical trial, a new drug that is hoped to be good is tested in volunteer patients and in escalating dosings until often a so-called maximum tolerated dose is achieved, at which point side effects, and there's a plethora of them, they become too dominant or problematic, and that's sort of the dose where you need to stop and hope that at that point the tumor is, is dead. You then move from that, if you don't find major liabilities there, you don't find things that are really problematic. You then move into more uh, into a more advanced clinical trials involving tens, hundreds, and maybe ultimately a couple hundred to maybe a thousand patients. And if, it, if, the, if the concept survives that phase, then pharma is all interested, and you know all the investors are all interested, and the patients are interested, and then maybe you have a product. So is this this is an industry around it? No single lab, no company can really take this from A to Z. But it's this, it's still for targeted therapies even, this unexpected um, hitting of other targets that you didn't anticipate, right? You can envision in the computer docking a molecule against uh, a target and you say, well, it fits well, I'm really happy about it. But unless you test the 10,000 other molecules that are also in the cell that could spuriously or, or directly bind the target too and be inhibited, you don't really know what the side effect. So targeted, so targeted therapies have majorly advanced um, uh, the, the survival of patients in subgroups of cancers, but for many major cancers and for some of the major blood cancers, progress is still not where it needs to be. If you look at uh, patients with acute myelogenous leukemia today, then there's about uh, 20,000 of them in the US per year. Uh, about 65% of them will be dead um, two years after diagnosis. 
if you look at uh, other cancers, for instance, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, you're diagnosed today, unless you're very unlucky, maybe your survival is approaching what your survival would have been without the disease. Multiple myeloma has had major advances from combination therapies, and various lymphomas have benefited a lot, and the goal is, is that if you cannot cure, if you cannot say, well, you, you really got rid of this, at least you can coexist with the illness like you would with diabetes, heart failure, psoriasis, or rheumatoid arthritis. At least coexist with the illness so that you don't die from it and hopefully still have a decent quality of life. Yes, please. Why is there such a difference between chronic lymphoma and lymphoma? Because it's not like you're getting the same Yeah. So, hey, Dr. Malik, can you repeat the question? Yeah. The lady was asking why we're we using, you know, was sort of indirectly asking, why are we using terms like acute leukemia, chronic leukemia, and what are the underlying biological drivers of that difference? Well, it's actually pretty, it's actually, the, the initial categorization was actually pretty simplistic. If you are diagnosed with an acute leukemia, for instance, what happens is, is that the cells divide like crazy. You can have uh, 20,000 leukemia cells floating today, and two weeks later there could be, there could be 500 times more. There is a certain capacity limit at which point your body just cannot take this many cells, and you're done. The proliferation rate and the, 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 the dividing rate is high, and the death rate is very low. You basically just go logarithmically and generate a very large amount of tumor cells. And acute just means if you don't do anything about it, you acutely die, sadly, within weeks to months. The chronic leukemias, of course, every, this is very, very, this is sort of stretching the surface a little bit. The, the chronic leukemias um, are not characterized by a high tumor birth rate. This has been measured in some chronic leukemias, and the daily birth rate of new cells may be as low as 1%. So if you use mathematical formulas to calculate how long that will take to a doubling or quadrupling or whatever, you're talking weeks to months, sometimes years. So it's a question of, as you alluded to, birth rate of tumor cells or division versus death. If all you do is divide, and you can divide in less than 24 hours, and if you do that for a long time, two to the whatever the number is, is a very big number. Yes? Is, is the rate of cell death or apoptosis, is that uniform across all blood cancers? No. So is the rate of apoptosis uniform across all blood cancers? So first of all, what is apoptosis? So we all have somewhat of an understanding what cell death is, right? The cell is there and then you step on it and it's dead. Um, but uh, you know, in blood cancers, uh, you don't physically really damage the cells. You when your chemotherapy hits your cell, your DNA or RNA or protein, which makes up the cell, the building blocks of the cell, gets damaged. And the cells are equipped with mechanisms to recognize that maybe the damage is too much and that they will not really survive, or if they survive, they'll be very abnormal. And so they activate a program, a cell death program, called epoptosis, cell death. And we rely on these programs to actually tickle these programs so that the cells tilt over and die. But um, that machinery that underlies the apoptotic process involves many different components. And the cancer cells, again, are sneaky and smart enough to deactivate multiple parts of that machinery, up to the point where they become completely resistant to apoptosis. So you have a spectrum from very sensitive cells, a patient with a lymphoid leukemia that you give prednisone by mouth may kill off 90% of the cells, while a patient with a drug-resistant acute leukemia, you give the same stuff and it would do absolutely nothing. So, where does academia, where does Michigan Medicine, where do folks that do research, where do they come in? Well, we are fundamentally, we are fundamentally motivated by uh, curiosity 
and the desire to advance knowledge and the desire to affect change, like many of you in your own professions. And we want to uh, use our education and then you know, further post-consolidation learning to improve ourselves, to rise to the occasion and uh, improve our understanding of the knowledge uh, that, that surrounds blood cancers and then use that knowledge to treat better. So what uh, are typical physician scientists doing? They often specialize on a certain cancer and then they may, for instance, collect cancer cells from many patients, cryopreserve them in biobanks, and then across a panel of 100 or 200 cancers from 200 patients, try to find changes from normal would catalog these changes, would study these changes, would make modifications to cancer cells in a dish or after injection into a mouse, <coughs> would see how these modifications affect cancer growth, how that would affect therapy. We procure cancer cells before and after therapy to see what the cell has learned that will make it more resistant to therapy. So we're looking at the dynamics of relapse after therapy. We're working with chemists and other natural scientists to see whether we can advance therapies, possibly involving new targets, possibly involving new compounds. There are folks who go scuba diving somewhere in, 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 in coral reefs and try to sample everything they see, hoping that there are molecules in there that can, that can kill cancer cells, and they have. Or we design drugs de novo using computers, computer-aided drug designs, and then taking these drugs making them first, right, and then apply them to cancer cells. And um, we do all this in a hopefully structured way so that systematically over time knowledge base increases and the ability to uh, attack the cancer improves. So we also, uh, we as the collective we, work on better methods of diagnosis possibly detecting cancers before they are full-blown cancers, detecting so-called precancerous states, which regretfully many of us harbor. Hopefully never develop full-blown cancer, but we have precancerous states in us, including me. We want to characterize them better and maybe nip them in the bud and say, hey, you are precancerous, but we want to not make sure that you become a full-blown cancer. And we can maybe do this, this, and this via diet changes, as I was asked, or via infusion of medications or changes in the environment, less smoking, you name it, to possibly prevent these things from becoming full-blown problems. Mechanisms of resistance to therapy are very important, right? You have a cancer that responds in 90% of patients, which is great, but if 60% of them relapse after you have therapy given, then clearly there is a resistance mechanism and what happens uh, is, is that when you have a very large number of cells that even though they may look alike in many different ways, they're not, a, they're not similar to one another. For every million cells you have, you have a new property, a new quality that's hidden in the sea of the other cells. And that property may very well be an intrinsic way of dealing with the drug that you're about to give to the cancer. And so while, you are, while you may be able to kill the majority of the cells, unfortunately many stay behind. And these cells are likely at least partly the origin of relapse, which can happen weeks, months, or years after you initially receive your therapy. So characterizing these resistance mechanisms for therapy is very important, because if you can identify what the mechanisms are, maybe you can intervene, or you can add additional therapies as combination therapies or find some other tricks to prevent regrowth. So maybe concluding um, what we're doing in the hematologic malignancy group at the University of Michigan is we have a number of investigators like me who have laboratories that have tumor banks and uh, patients and we're trying to uh, advance um, very actively uh, target identification we're trying to 
categorize cancer into good and bad actors. We're trying to de-emphasize therapy if we think somebody would do without, would do well without for a while. But for the ones that are not doing well, we want to improve on therapies by learning what doesn't work and make it better. So for instance, in acute leukemia, we have developed very sensitive assays to detect leukemia cells that are swimming around that you could never see with the naked eye. We can now detect one in 50,000 leukemia cells that are sneakily floating around, and we can track it, and we want to in the future use these tracking mechanisms to kill it. We have identified mechanisms where cancer-associated uh, changes have, uh, which clearly are beneficial to the cancer cells, have resulted in the cells becoming very vulnerable to us turning off certain pathways. And we want to use that to develop new drugs. Um, and we're doing this across the spectrum of illnesses, acute leukemia, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, T-cell lymphoma, to some degree multiple myeloma and growing, and to some degree multiple uh, myeloproliferative diseases. So that is a sort of rough overview of blood cancers from my hand. Uh, there is no particular structure here, and I, uh, as I said, I hope that many of you will have questions so that we can have sort of a secondary level of um, discussion about the various things I touched upon. Thank you for your question. How, how cooperative is the national and the worldwide scientific community in sharing their findings and their you know? I, I think generally speaking, rather cooperative. So first of all, human nature may be at times secretive, at times not so much. But when we accept grants and funding from funding agencies, and um, certainly at the time when we publish our results in, in papers that you can access via Google, like you talked to me about Lancet, and there's 50 other major journals out there, the prerequisite for, for publishing your work there is to deposit elements of your work in national databases. So if you have used some very sophisticated technique to characterize changes in the proteins called uh, uh, mass spectrometry, you have to deposit that data in a, in a, in a repository that are maintained often by the government uh, to the National Institute of Health. And so all that has built an enormous body of, of, of primary data. And um, I think there's a lot of sharing. If you publish a mouse that you've changed in some way to develop cancer or being a good model for something, you have to provide that mouse upon request to people that want to study it as well. So I think there's a, actually a very large amount of sharing going on. There's always a few bad apples here and there, but for the most part, it's pretty collaborative. So, so I would say it's a yeah. I know they made improvements on um, like immunotherapy. What have they done with like CART T therapy and bone marrow transplants? Is there any like advances or changes that have been happening with that? Okay. So that's a great question because um, it allows me to expand a little bit on what immunotherapy is and then what transplant does and CAR T therapy, all these big words that we just used. So, so we all have an immune system. And if some foreign bug comes in, the immune system recognizes this and um, after a few days makes tons of antibodies that coat the bug and ultimately destroy it. And T lymphocytes are instructed to also go after these uh, organisms and have their own way of destroying them. So why then are cancer cells, which are not normal, and growing in patient, why are they not routinely attacked and destroyed by the immune system? Well, that was not so clear for a very long time. Um, but it had to do with, and this is descriptive, the fact that the body, when there's first just a few cells and there's more and more and more, the body becomes tolerant to these cells that are abnormal. It, it doesn't go after it full speed, it sort of let it be. Now, I'm sure there are many instances where it 
body says that's bad and I'm going to attack it and destroy it, but we would never know about it because the patient would never develop cancer. And how often the immune system really goes after incipient cancers and destroys them is unknown. But this immune surveillance scouts around all the time trying to find cancer cells, and if the cancer cells either are not recognized or have cloaked themselves through a variety of molecular mechanisms, they ultimately form a tumor. So then a whole bunch of very smart people have said, well, we need to break that tolerance. That tolerance is not good. The tumor is growing, the body is tolerant. We don't need that tolerance. We want to be intolerant towards the tumor. We want to kill the tumor, right? So a variety of um, ways were devised to break the tolerance by activating T cells through blocking inhibitory receptors that sit on the surface of T cells. These receptors uh, have been called checkpoints and the therapies are called checkpoint inhibitor therapies. And they have certainly revolutionized treatment for, more, for melanoma, black like skin cancer revolutionized the therapy for certain types of lung cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, for sure, right? So immunotherapies are a really big deal, but unfortunately they don't work for the majority of cancers in, in their current form. So then, how do we refine, how do we, again, same concepts, right? You learn, you hit a wall, you try to understand the wall, you learn more. So, um, there are a number of reasons why tumor cells don't respond. Some of them simply are so cloaked that even if you break tolerance, they can't be seen. Others are hiding somewhere in niches where the other cells can't go. Some have found active ways of keeping the attacking cells at bay. There's a whole mechanism, a whole slew of mechanisms. An alternative form of immunotherapy that you alluded to is not based on blocking checkpoint molecules but it's based on genetically altering T cells to attack tumor cells. These T cells are taken out of the patient's body. They are infected in a dish with viruses that are used as transport vehicles to arm these T cells with tumor targeting receptors, and then they're reinfused, reinfused into the patient. These T cells that are now genetically altered are called chimeric antigen receptor positive T cells or CAR T cells. And CAR T cells are also quite a revolution and they are proof for the treatment of acute lymphoblastic leukemia and uh, uh, are approved in the treatment of certain types of lymphoma. And there are ongoing developmental programs with hundreds of types of T cells trying to expand their reach to other cancers. These CAR T cell infusions are a big deal and they have a lot of side effects as you may or may not know, including things that we call cytokine storms and, and uh, neurological side effects, but the vast majority of patients get through that with expert care and ultimately a good number of them are actually cured of their disease. CAR T cells also, it's all, first of all, very cost intensive to make these, but CAR T cells also ultimately are triggered by the tumor cells. If your CAR T cell is directed against, let's say, surface molecule A, the tumor cell may simply just downregulate it or mutate A and be not recognized anymore. There are many other ways of resistance to CAR T cell. So people are now trying to arm T cells with more than one CAR to hit two or three targets at the same time. And those trials are also uh, ongoing in many centers in the US, including some of Bone marrow transplantation is something I didn't mention at all, so I'm glad you asked me about it. And so um, I uh, explained to you in the very beginning today that most blood cancers arise in the bone marrow because I said that there are uh, long living cells that are called stem cells that regenerate all the blood. But these uh, stem cells mutate and they become corrupted and become ultimately the root of the blood cancer problem, and even though you can nuke 99% of the cells that they give rise to, if you don't get rid of the malignant stem cells, you uh, will have a relapse. Because the stem cells sit in the bone marrow, folks have said, well, why don't we just poison that marrow completely? And sure, you can do that, but the patient will die. And so you have to not only poison the marrow, but the cancer cells completely, you have to provide new marrow. 
and that is called a bone marrow transplantation. A matched human being's bone marrow is harvested through a variety of techniques, cryopreserved, thawed, and reinfused into a patient that has received lethal doses of chemotherapy. Lethal in the sense that without bone marrow you can't live. But the new bone marrow that comes in substitutes for your own, hopefully is healthy and allows you to form blood. Did that answer your question or? Sorry. No, no, I'll come to you in just a second. Uh, just the gentleman had a question and then. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks for your work. Yeah. Great. My question is about whether you're aware of any relationship between, um, I guess, the, the changes in cell shape and size that sometimes goes with my local neoplasm and vision loss, optic nerve swelling, vision loss. That's a very, very specialized question. Uh, as you know, uh, or may know, vision loss from optic nerve damage. So the optic nerve is a, is a, is a big nerve that goes to the back of the, of the eye bulbs and gets all the signals from the retina and sends it to the brain so that, that we can see. Uh, optic nerve damage from myeloproliferative disease, I have to, I have to pass. I, I don't even recall having met an individual like this. We, we do see patients, I have some, that develop something called optic neuritis, which is an inflammation of the optic nerve, uh, immunological in nature, sometimes triggered by viruses, sometimes unknown. And if it's caught early enough, response to immunosuppressive therapy. That's called optic neuritis. You can think of it maybe as a form of myelos of um, multiple sclerosis, but it's its own disease. Energy. We sadly sometimes see leukemias and lymphoma learning to live in the in the space and fluid surrounding the brain. Uh, you know, there is a couple hundred cc of fluid flowing around your brain called cerebrospinal fluid, and when that gets uh, penetrated, infected, or penetrated by tumor cells, they eventually learn to grow there. They stuck the surface, it's gross, but they stuck the surface of the brain and sometimes even can attack the optic nerve and can lead to dysfunction. But that particular morphological changes in the cancer cells would lead to problems with the optic nerve I haven't heard of. Of course, when you get a very large number of bad cells, they change the flow parameters of blood, the viscosity of some folks get very problematic uh, side effects from that in their retina, and some even lose their vision from, or transiently, uh, from, these, um, from this increased blood viscosity that happens as a consequence of having too many cells. Thank you. Thank you. Is, is the blood in the body completely regenerated over time? Do we being formed, are we sure. Some, right? For sure. So, so as I said, um, the blood is hierarchically organized, all right? At the apex of the hierarchy, which is somewhere deep in your bone marrow, sits a stem cell, all right? That stem cell divides, if you press it, and it divides in a way called asymmetric division, okay? I'm gonna get to your question in a minute, but it helps to understand this, to understand what I'm gonna say. The cell basically finds a way, like me taking myself into two. One half of me becomes the stem cell again, and the other half is on its way to generate blood. So that cell then divides again and again and again, and then branches off in a process called differentiation into ultimately red blood cells, B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, and so on, monocytes. So, as we said, the blood, the red juice that flows in our vein, the red stuff comes from hemoglobin in the red cells. If you took all that out and just looked at the white cells, there you have 10 or so types of different blood cells. And the more you become the ultimate product, the, the final named differentiated blood cell, the less long you live. So a neutrophil may live a day or two, 
And if there's an infection, they get consumed maybe within seconds or minutes or hours. A red blood cell, as you may know, lives about three, four months. A B lymphocyte lives months, you know, in a sort of film, they live weeks. So there is, if you multiply that by the total number of cells that are blood cells, there's every day massive scale death. Uh, either from consumption or just basically their pre-programmed lifespan is short. As I said, the cancer has figured out to deactivate some of these lifespan issues and hang around for longer, or there's just massive overproduction. So every day, you regenerate the cells that are being used up or that die off, right? And so you may ask yourself, how do we know how much to produce, right? If you produce too much, maybe you just sort of explode, right? And if you produce too little, there's nothing left, right? So there are complicated feedback mechanisms where there's terminal differentiated cells and cells in the middle, they send signals back to the early cells and tell them, look, this is how much we have of this. You know, it's like an inventory at a Lowe's or a Walmart, right? You grab a piece and the camera tells you immediately to headquarter, let's produce another thousand of that or that. Same is true for blood. Your blood levels are remarkably constant. If you measured your CBC, you know, daily for a year, you would find roughly the same number of white cells, red cells, platelets. So they're, they're kept under homeostatic conditions. They're kept at a certain controlled level. You break that feedback mechanism, you generate too much. And that's a problem. Please. Are there any uh, prescription drugs when taken over a long period of time, 30, 40, 50 years, for whatever reason, that adversely affect the stem cells to start producing cancerous cells? Are there any studies or any uh, anything like that? Um, that is known scientifically? Prescription medicine drugs. So you're talking about stuff you can get for other illnesses? Yes. Okay. Well, there, there likely are quite a few, and you know, there are probably thousand drugs or so that are uh, you know, approved. But you know, you know, there were times when, um, so there were times when um, certain uh, blood cancers were, for instance, treated with radioactive phosphorus. You may not think of that as a medication, but it was a medication. It was given by vein. And the phosphorus was radioactive because it was incorporated into DNA and then beamed the DNA and killed the cell that incorporated the phosphorus. Because there was a lot of production of cells, rapidly producing cells died preferentially. But that radioactive phosphorus beamed other cells and, and set the stage for leukemia happening 10 or 20 or 30 years later. There are a number of uh, medications uh, that have um, smallish risk, but over time, and if given to enough patients, likely increase the risk of cancer. Of course, the FDA and the government agency wouldn't accept too many of these medications to be around unless they were very beneficial in some particular part of medicine. Um, I mean, you know, you overcount the Tylenol and pain medications and all this stuff is, is not carcinogenic. Uh, you have a follow-up question to this. I do. Yeah. So yeah. like Crohn's disease, when you're taking Humira, and right. they say there's a risk of lymphoma, lymphoma how does that right. happen? Right. The gentleman was asking about stem cells, and I was scratching the surface of my brain to see what we actually really know about stem cell toxicity. Because in order to detect that, you have to have a way of measuring the stem cells in a human being. And you have to then characterize them. And that's actually not easily done. So you can only look at the long-term effect of the damage to the stem cell by the acquisition of new things like a new cancer. There are immunosuppressive medication given, for instance, for inflammatory bowel disease, but also methotrexate and others that are associated with a slightly elevated risk. You know, I don't know the exact number, but maybe twofold, of developing non hodgkins lymphoma. I'm not an expert in this area. Uh, I would have to assume it's, um, so it's always likely a combination of things. It's either that you create a stimulus for more cell division. 
if, if a happy cell decides to divide, what happens in that process is that that cell has to divide its entire DNA, the, the, the substance that encodes for all the information that builds us. That's three times 10 to the nine nucleotides per cell. And in its cell division, there are somewhere in the order of um, a few mistakes made for each cell each day per division. So if you multiply this with the number of cells that divide, the number is astronomical. If these mistakes that are made are the seed of cancer, that will result ultimately in cancer. So if whatever medication you use in some way stimulates the immune system to proliferate a little more, you get more chances for mistakes. But that may not be the mechanism for the drug you mentioned. There could also be deregulation of feedback mechanisms. There could be prevention of death of cells that have mutagenized and should die and are kept alive. I would have to delve deeper into this to really, to really know. Yes? So is there such a thing as a erythrocyte cancer? Yes. And how does that work? Because the cell is still having nuclear Right. So the red blood, so the, the cancer that you're referring to is called polycythemia vera, and it's, um, it's an accumulation of too many red blood, red blood cells, erythrocytes. Your hematocrit or hemoglobin value rises over time, and at some point when you cross certain thresholds, this is not well tolerated by patients. Um, they may develop blood clots, they may develop hyperviscosity, con congestive heart failure, and a couple hundred years ago, if you had this, you would eventually die from this. Today, hopefully, very few, if anybody does. So how can a cell go nucleus? Yeah, the red blood cells that are there in excess, it's a little hard to call them the cancer cells. Yeah, it's a little hard to call them the cancer cells. These, these, these extra red blood cells do not do what I told you early on cancer cells do. Invade, eat, globe, whatnot. There's just too many of them. The defect lies more apical in that, in that pyramid I talked to you about, whereby early stem and progenitor cells acquire a mutation that drives their growth and makes them resistant to death. That mutation was discovered 15 years ago or so. It's called a JAK2 mutation. Since then, there have been other mutations in mitral and calreticulin that also do similar things. And it results in massive activation of so-called jack stat signaling that seems to favor erythrocyte differentiation and doesn't respond well to feedback. It's also luckily a disease for which knowledge over time has accumulated substantially and um, most patients do rather well with it. Uh, thanks for being here. Is there any evidence that blood cancers run in families? Yes. Sadly. So, um, first of all, um, when we talk about familial illnesses, uh, we're talking about a predisposition to developing cancers that's encoded in your DNA for the most part, right? Of course, you could also spend all day out there on the field with your sibling and be exposed to any kind of insecticide and pesticide and whatnot side, and maybe you both get cancer. But for the most part, when we talk familial cancer, we're talking about genetically encoded predispositions. I mean, the classical example is BRCA1 positive breast cancer, right? Where you, when you inhibit, when you inherit it, <coughs> The gene mutation, you have a very high incidence of breast cancer. So in blood cancers, there are also genes that predispose to cancer. And we're increasingly learning about what they are and how to find them and what to do about it. So there was a major discovery in the year 2014 whereby uh, investigators from a number of institutions found that about 10% of folks over 70, and I'm not trying to rule you dinner, but um, <laughs> that about 10% of folks over 70 have precancerous cells floating in the blood. <coughs> now, these precancerous cells are not 
nasty enough for us to screen everybody for it and change their blood out because the chance of developing real blood cancer is still rather smallish. But this precancerous state is called clonal hematopoiesis. Clonal hematopoiesis is, uh, is present when 2% or more of your cells, 4% really, are progeny of one another, a so-called clone. And um, there is predisposition to develop clonal hematopoiesis. And um, in other blood cancers, there are clear-cut families that have a very high incidence of the same cancer type. But when we look collectively, the collective we, when we looked, sequenced their genomes, for instance, of 50 cancer families or whatever, it's not always that there is one dominant gene that is across all families the same. But people have acquired so-called private mutations in their family bad luck, that in their particular family causes the cancer, and the next family is a different gene, and so any kind of sophisticated genetic screening basically will, will miss almost all families. But yes, you can see patients with one type of blood cancer have family member with other types, and sometimes it's random and sometimes it's predisposition. You can have patients, for instance, with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. If you go to their siblings and look at their blood, you already find small clones there that may one day become chronic lymphocytic leukemia. But because getting chronic lymphocytic leukemia is not a death sentence anymore, we don't start worrying people 20 years before because they may get so worried that they'll start drinking or do drugs or jump into the building and shorten their life in a way that you would otherwise not want to happen, right? What is Merkel cell cancer? Merkel cell cancer, you got the wrong guy here. Uh, for Merkel cell cancer, you would have to talk to a gentleman named Ansh Luglosh at the University of Michigan, who does a whole Merkel cell cancer program. It's a skin cancer um, associated in a very small fraction of patients with CLL, but it's not as if the CLL is the cancer. It's, it's a skin cancer driven by, by viruses, and it's pretty nasty. So again, childhood cancer are treated by pediatric hematologists, which is not an area of expertise of mine, but as you probably know, for the majority of cancers, children do better because uh, their cancers are more um, susceptible to the chemo given and the doses that kids tolerate versus adults is a lot higher. Having said that, on the adult side, um, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas are called non-Hodgkin's lymphomas because they're not Hodgkin's lymphomas. Hodgkin's lymphoma, is um, an illness that affects maybe five to 8,000 or so Americans per year. And it's a very eminently treatable disease now. Um, it is a paradigmatic illness for 40 years of development in clinical trials and, and cancer therapy. So Hodgkin's lymphoma, which has a certain way of looking when you look under the microscope, a certain way of presenting in you know 20 year olds and 60 year olds, not too much in between. That's sort of a set of illnesses called Hodgkin's lymphoma after, I believe, a gentleman that was by the name of Hodgkin. Non-Hodgkin's lymphomas is a much larger group of illnesses. And they're B or T lymphocyte-based lymphomas that occupy lymph nodes, spleen, bone marrow, and then when they become angrier, they can invade other organs. And, um, in the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma um, category, there are lymphomas derived from T cells, and so they're called T cell non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. And they comprise 10% of all the non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. And then there are the B cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which comprise about 90%. And in aggregate, I would say this disease category affects, we'll have to look at the exact number, somewhere between, oh, easily, 40 to 60, 70,000 patients in the US per year. If you look at the World Health Organization classification of lymphomas, the non Hodgkin's lymphoma category alone is now a page, double space, so 60 illnesses. And the more we learn about them, the more they be 
par parcel, the part and the more they're dissected, and almost every year there's a new name given to a sub entity. And um, we clinically categorize them into lymphomas that grow very fast, and that sounds bad, right? But that makes them very susceptible to chemotherapy. So if we can nuke them the first time around, we cure people. And then there are on the opposite spectrum, the ones that grow very slowly, we call them indolent. And we often don't treat them right when we see the patient, um, only when they have problems. Patients live with these lymphomas for a long time, but we cannot cure them. They are chronic illnesses that behave good in most and not so good in some, but um, ultimately um, are not curable with conventional approaches. <coughs> Please talk a little bit about um, the CRISPR technology and does it show any promise for the treatment of the cancers? Sure. Right, so CRISPR, you're really getting into the nuts and bolts of stuff, but uh, that's cool. Um, so we use CRISPR in the lab a lot. Um, so CRISPR is a complicated uh, thing. You have to, you have to so there were, a num there were a bunch of investigators, uh, largely out of California, two women that received the Nobel Prize just uh, a few years ago, for the discovery that um, certain bacteria have developed their own funny immune system by taking pieces of DNA from invading organism and use them against them by using that DNA to guide cutting enzymes to the DNA of these organisms and cleave them up. It's very sophisticated, it's very cool. And you can adapt that technology uh, and create your own targeting guides and you can basically clip any, any piece of DNA you want in a pre-specified location. So let's say you had a bad gene in your genome and let's say we're not there yet, you can take the cells out, clip that piece of DNA away and restore it potentially with a wild type copy, you could potentially cure diseases caused by single genes, right? And proof of principle studies have already happened in this space, in mice and in men, humans, and um, this is a very rapidly growing technology. We use it personally extensively in the laboratory to destroy genes or modify them, and by doing so, subtract that gene from the equation if you wish, and then study the consequences of that um, in very many different with regards to its clinical application, there are already companies out there that use CRISPR technology trying to advance it as uh, new therapeutics. And there the issue is not so much anymore of one of um, being able to cut whatever you want and trying to avoid it cutting randomly somewhere else, which is never a good thing. But the problem is more one of delivery, right? If you wanted to take CRISPR to nuke a particular driver in a cancer, you would have to almost take all the cancer cells out, infect them all, and put it back in the body, right? If you could do that, you don't really need CRISPR anymore. You just take all the cells out and throw them away. So, um, so CRISPR is, is a form of genetic manipulation. It's gene therapy. It's clearly growing rapidly. Um, it's used in almost all labs now. It's a standard technique. And um, it's very powerful. Um, I don't know who was first. Maybe you, you and then, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah if you don't mind. At the very beginning, you said it's very important to get a correct diagnosis. It is. Or it's not going to work. It so may not work, yeah. Um, only by a lot of people work. Do our doctors here in this area of the state work for all they take them? Yeah, I mean, I can't speak for all of them, and I certainly can't speak for all of them on the receiving end either. I, I have interacted with folks here uh, from Traverse City and other areas. And, um, you know, um, you uh, can visit another doctor anytime. You can visit more doctors. You can doctor shop if you wish. But at a minimum, I think if you have cancer, I would generally speaking recommend some sort of opinion from somebody else. At least two I would. I, I personally would. Even if it's something trivial, you know, trivial meanings, everything looks and feels and, and looks exactly like the cancer that's being described. There are so many nuances now and so many subtleties that even if the diagnosis is correct, maybe the subdiagnosis is already a little fishy 
and maybe the prognostication and the targeting of therapy to a specific subtypes. Um, so yes, I think we work well together. I don't know for sure whether that's true for everybody, uh, but um, you know, a patient uh, you know that visits another doctor has two choices to make, right? You visit and get an opinion and say thank you very much and go back to your home, or you stay with a new doctor because maybe you like something better. But these are personal choices. Uh, you know, whatever you want to. Do. I think you always come first. It's never really worry about what somebody thinks about you leaving, crossing, changing, get an opinion. It should never be on your mind. It should always be trying to get the most information about the problem you have and it should always be about the best choices for you. Um, this is for a, a, a earlier question. Um, I think about CAR-T therapy. You mentioned that it was used for ALL. When did they start using CAR-T for ALL? How long has that been in practice? A couple of years for pediatric ALL. Oh, it's just pediatric? Pediatric ALL, okay. mostly. It's also used for uh, B-cell, the diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, neurofibrillary refractory, or follicular lymphoma. But this is just recently, correct? All in the last few years. Okay. So when you say hand in hand, do you mean that that the patient has both? We didn't, I didn't hear the question. Yeah, the question was when you have chronic lymphocytic leukemia. I mean, there are various forms of this question, but one way of this interpreting the question is if you have chronic lymphocytic leukemia, uh, can you also have a B cell lymphoma at the same time? When you have chronic lymphocytic leukemia, something I specialized in, and we'll come back for another hour and a half of talking, but, but the short version of this is is that about uh, one to two percent per year of patients with CLL transform their illness clinically into a higher grade lymphoma? How does that affect the treatment? Yeah, yeah, it has major consequences, regretfully. So, first of all, the trigger of why you transform and when you transform are only partially known. One could certainly take a CLL patient's CLL cells and do an extensive molecular characterization either commercially available or not, it would be very costly. But the predictive value of then looking at someone and say, you have a 27% chance, and you know, that's very imprecise though. So predicting who transforms is not a good thing to do. Uh, but when you transform, you know it because something will grow faster than before. Either a lymph node is growing out of your neck or some other problem arises, bone pain, you name it, or a plethora of symptoms. And that's a new illness. That transformation is called Richter's transformation and um, necessitates therapy more or less right away, within weeks, and usually involves poly agent chemotherapy. And uh, regretfully, patients with transformation fall into two categories. The ones that respond to therapy, they do better, and the ones that don't, they don't do well. Uh, there was a gentleman in the back, I'm sorry, and then I'll come back to you. If you have a pregnant patient who, who reports a family history of childhood leukemia, do you recommend harvesting the cord blood at the time of delivery for cord blood management? No, no, I'm not a transplant, though, okay? So I don't deal much with transplant-related issues. And I know that this issue of cord blood preservation has come up uh, many, over the last couple of years, and it comes sort of in waves. There are certainly major cord blood banks in this country that have large collections of cord blood, but um, cord blood is not anymore sort of the, the, I guess, miraculous way of dealing with transplantation that it may, be, have, may have been looked at, let's say, 5 or 10 or 15 years ago. The average adult is too big to be fully served by one cord blood unit. And, and often there are you know, uh, issues with engraftment and whatnot. There have also been substantial advances in using mismatched bone marrow from um, donors that have vastly expanded the repertoire of units that can be used to transplant somebody. So again, take what I say with a grain of salt because I'm not a transplanter, but I don't think we routinely store a cord blood. And 
and it would also necessitate really a, a commercial organization because think about the number of units that would need to be sold and whatnot. Cancer itself has been around many, many years in many forms and many organs. Uh, been treated by, as you said, radiation therapy, cancer therapy, or uh, surgery, all different modalities. Blood, of course, is the one cancer that starts out spread all over the body. And my question then, do you have any personal feelings as to are we approaching the final treatment finding that may cure cancer of different modalities, from starting probably from blood originally? I mean, I would say yes. Uh, it's just um, I cannot tell you when exactly, but you know, you know, think about the phone you used 20 years ago on the computer you have in your pocket now, yeah, yeah. and think about the acceleration of knowledge, which is you know logarithmic. Um, uh, I have personally witnessed. Uh, I'm a CLL expert. I've seen, I've treated patients extensively with chemotherapy for many years and benefited them, but ultimately, you know, it has its limits. I've seen the transition to many targeted therapies in CLL, keeping many of these individuals alive uh, now and doing well. And um, I think most blood cancers will become chronic illnesses. Again, the word cure is a bit of a technicality. You're cured if your cancer is gone today and you die one day from something else and it never came back. But that's like trying to anticipate the future and looking back, right? Because, you know, how, do you, how else do you tell somebody that they're cured? That's why I said earlier to you, uh, sensitive techniques that can measure residual, minute amounts of cancer hiding in the body or not are very important in predicting whether you indeed are cured or may relapse one day or whatnot. So um, I think in many cancers, myeloma, types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, CLL, Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, certain mild peripheral diseases, the advances have been dramatic. But nonetheless, um, there's a couple of lingering problems still. First of all, let's say you uh, had CLL or some other illness and you're now on a medication that keeps you alive, but you pay 160000 per year for it, not you, but your insurance. Uh, you start getting cumulative side effects from prolonged usage. There's uh, competition for health resources. There's more and more people on very expensive therapies are kept alive. There are other problems that sort of start bubbling up. Um, you know, of course, you know, not dying is, is a major advance, but, but things then accumulate over time. I, I, I think there are, in progress, there are different types of progress. We always want to go from the problem A to the solution B, C, or D in a linear way, right? You know, you have this cancer, and I'm going to go to my lab right now, and I'm going to devise the exact path of figuring out how to cure it, right? But in reality, that's not how it works. In reality, it's more like, um, you know, the French scientist Pasteur who, who said, you know, luck favors the prepared mind. You have to be in the right space at the right time, and a couple of things are coming together, and you're drawing the right conclusions. It's very often not linear. And um, therefore, it's more important to be logical and rational about your approaches, and initially aiming for advances, and then if they're bigger than you anticipated, well, that's great. But it's not always a linear path. Yes? Uh, it's a small room, I think, we can hear. Yeah, I, speaking on that, I just want to hear about uh, what you think about combination drug therapies sure. and how that affects uh, relapse rates and resistance. Right. Well, first of all, in order to have combination therapies, you need to have individual therapies that are effective, right? I mean, you couldn't combine a dead drug with a working drug hoping to get something better out of it. Combination therapies usually imply that you have individually active drugs that when working together, not only are working, uh, each are still working, but hopefully you even achieve synergies. But the fundamental reason why you do combination therapies has to do with the fact that cancer, when you are trying to treat it, is not a uniform entity. As I said, for every million cancer cells, there is a new one. So when you have 10 to the 12 cancer cells floating in your blood at the time of a leukemia diagnosis, 
there's 10 to the 6 different phenotypes of, or types of leukemia floating in that leukemia. Now, type may be an overstatement. Many of the changes that separate these are inconsequential for therapy. But we're going back to folks that did mathematical modeling on this 50 years ago or so suggests that there is about a resistant cell for every 10 to the 6 cancer cell. So if you go in with a very effective therapy and you try to do 10 to the 12, 10 to the 6 at a minimum, and likely more will stay behind and form a regrowth. But when you go in with multiple therapies that each have this likelihood, it, it factorizes. And so by the time you have three or four therapies, like you're suppressing the AIDS virus and AIDS patient, and other similar um, therapeutic scenarios, you ultimately reach a point where there is no resistance. Because uh, as long as the therapies you're using are non-cross resistant. So in other words, you couldn't take four drugs from the same drug class and apply it because they would all be likely resistant to holding them. But if you have three or four non-cross resistant drugs, you likely will keep the cancer at bay. And so it's likely that therapies for blood cancers will soon comprise cocktails of medications. And again, the only problems is synergistic side effects and massive health budgets to pay for these things. How does that, how does toxicity factor into a lot of that? You know, it, fit, it factors in. If, if the toxicity is a, is a little pimple on your lip, you say that's all right. But if you get neuropathy or pulmonary fibrosis or your heart doesn't work as well or you have mental changes, then those combinations wouldn't make it because people wouldn't want to take them and you wouldn't want to prescribe them. So the toxicities of the individual drugs add up in combination and then there may be new toxicities imparted on the combination by drug-drug interactions. Yes? So I am a Hodgkin survivor. Great. I went through chemotherapy at the University of Michigan while I was pregnant the entire time. Oh, well. My fourth child. Uh -huh. And I can't say enough good things about the University of Michigan. Great. And I was the very first patient of my own doctor, Dr. Harry Erba. Yeah, Harry, yes. And um, he was fabulous. Yeah. And um, the whole aspect of what I went through, and, and I never had a single side effect and nothing. And I'm just curious as to... That was 18 years ago. Right. Um, my daughter has continued to get blood work done just to make sure that there's nothing that passed on. Okay. Um, I've never had anything. She's never had anything. But is there any research into that? Secondary causes of, of chemotherapy. I mean, we know that alkylator-based therapies for Hodgkin's lymphoma, the so-called MOP regimen, which you likely did not get, uh, you likely got ABVD, but the MOP regimen it causes leukemia in subsets of patients, but not 18 years out. Most of these blood-borne secondary cancers happen two to seven years or so after the initial insult, if you wish. Um, th th there are folks who specialize on the consequences of giving chemotherapy to people. There's all kinds of consequences, depending on the cancer and the therapy. Not an area of my expertise, but yes, there, there is work. Is there work right now at the University of Michigan? I would have to think hard. You know, we have a very large institute of outcome research, whether some people are there looking into chemo related side effects, I don't know right now. I was but, never worried about that personally. Yeah. It's just nobody else in Traverse City at that time really knew right. about chemotherapy and pregnancy. Well, so I, chemo you know, during pregnancy is always anxiety inducing for everybody involved. And, uh, you know, it's a question of trimester and it's a question of what drugs you use and so on and so forth. Harry moved on to Alabama, and now he's a Duke, so he's, he's floating around. <laughs> yes? Do you, still, do you still see patients? Me personally? Yeah. yeah. Friday morning. Mostly with CLL. <laughs> I'm a CLL. Teacher. Okay, yeah, I do. Clinic is pretty full now, you know, when you keep people alive, which is a good thing. And they don't go somewhere else that ultimately uh, <laughs> It's the truth, actually. So. I've been on other neighborhoods, so in the Metro Detroit area, it is a community Yes, you're right. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Well, thank you for your time today. Sure. Yeah. For your voice of knowledge and reason. For 18 years, you've been a specialist. Right. What made you become a doctor? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, ultimately, I cannot really tell you because I knew that already I when I was like you. 10 years old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you hear all these things, right? Or you talk to your kids and they're in college and they have no idea what they want to be. That, that was never, never me. I knew that I wanted to do science and medicine since I was 10. Or, I don't know. I don't know what prompted it. I don't come from a physician family, so I have no idea. But, but, but it's been overall reasonably enjoyable. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have a question? Oh, yes. Um, you, you talked about your specialty. Uh, are there specialists that you have done for all the different types of blood cancer? Sure. It's organized by disease groups, if you wish. There's a lymphoma program where you can call the coordinator and be seen for lymphoma. There is a leukemia program, it's seen for leukemia, there's a myeloproliferative disease group of investigators, and then a myeloma doctors. And then if you have something that doesn't fall into those four parts, you need somebody more, more serious that can pick up your care. All right, thank you very much. I'd just like to thank everybody for coming. I hope you found this illuminating, interesting, and informative. And I'd like to welcome all of you to come on Monday, October 3rd at 3 o'clock when Dr. Gabriel Corfus will be talking about hearing loss, understanding uh, the research and talking about the treatment for hearing loss. And as you leave today, uh, there is a pamphlet that will have additional information. Uh, and if we can be of, of any help to you, Dr. Malik has kindly agreed to stay uh, for a little bit. So if anyone has any additional questions or would just like to speak with Dr. Malik, he'd be happy to speak with you. Again, thank you.